What's up YouTube? It's Andrea from VW Family Farm and today I wanted to talk to you about there's a lot of videos going around right now called the good the bad and the ugly of homesteading so we just thought we would jump in there and make one of our own and so Ben asked me to do this one he he likes to show the how to's and all that but he's not just getting on here and talking is not really his thing so I'm gonna give this a go um, I've been thinking all morning about what all I wanted to tell you about let's start with the good there are so many good things about homesteading, it's gonna really be hard for me to narrow it down, but I'm gonna give it a shot. The first thing that came to my mind, a lot of people's videos I've watched said the food on their homestead, and that ranks right up there, but this is the first thing that came to my mind. As you can see, that's just the kids sitting in the living room. This is just a random Tuesday in almost August here in Arkansas and I'm spending time with my kids. That is, that's my number one benefit of this homesteading lifestyle. We spend so much time together. Ben does have a full-time job, but so he's gone, he's gone several days a week all day long, but he gets off at a decent time. And the rest of the time, if you find one of us, you're gonna pretty much find all four of us. We spend so much time together, whether it's whether we're working or playing or whatever we're doing, we are almost always together. So our, I say our circle is small, but it's tight. It's, and that's really true. We, the kids sometimes, I mean, they're teenagers. Sometimes if I say, let's go pick green beans, they'll grumble and say, oh, but they don't complain too much. And then sometimes I'll find them, they've just seen something that needs to be done and they'll just do it. So they're very hard workers and we just, we really enjoy our kids. We spend just almost every waking moment together. So that is my number one benefit of homesteading, homeschooling, all those things that kind of go hand in hand is how tight knit our family is. So, so that's the first good thing. Okay, number two that's good about homesteading is the animals. I love animals. I've always loved animals my whole life. So I'm showing you some of our sheep and goats right now. We've got, we've got several mama goats that are about to drop babies and I love having baby animals. So does the kids and, I, I, and Ben does too. He doesn't go as cuckoo over them as we do, but I love baby animals and with homesteading, we don't always keep them, but we do get to play with them for several weeks after they're born. So um, we've almost always got baby chicks and chickens running around. Here's some more of our animals. There's my Katie girl too. I tell Ben and the kids all the time, as if you've been watching us for long, we got this dog back in the spring. Actually, it was probably still winter, but, so she's not very old, but I love this dog. When I was really young, I got attacked by a Doberman and cut up my face pretty good, knocked me to the ground and was, it was pretty, pretty serious dog attack so I'm terrified of big dogs but this dog Ben says it, it it's gonna bring me out of my fear so and she has so far she's getting big but I'm not a bit afraid of her I tell the kids all the time I'll say guess what and they'll say we know you love Katie but she is just awesome the sheep are mowing the yard so again I just love having all the animals that's fun to me. A lot of people would say, oh, you're so tied down, but I love it. Okay, I cannot talk about the good of homesteading without mentioning the food, as I said earlier. That's almost what everyone ranked as their best thing about homesteading, and that is what got us into homesteading, as it gets, that's what gets most people into it, I think, is wanting to raise your own food. I'm sure there's other reasons, but I would say that's the number one. My tomatoes, you can see, are pitiful grown up with grass, but they're still producing tomatoes, so that is the goal. I try to tell myself I love a beautiful garden, but at this point, especially I'm taking you out to all my viney things, you can't keep the grass out of these unless you're using some kind of chemicals to spray, and I'm not going to do that. So at this point in the year, you just have to be okay with a few weeds. But I've still got squash growing out here. I've got lemon squash. We've got tons. These are Arkansas black watermelons. Tons of watermelons. We've got the Missouri state watermelon and um, 
think the other one's maybe the Mississippi. So we've got some striped ones out there. We got some yellow bellies. Look at this huge watermelon we grew this year. May not be able to grow a very big pumpkin, but man, I love that thing. It's huge. They should I have think... a watermelon challenge. Oh, oh. Emily just come up with a new one. Watermelon challenge. We've never been able to grow very good watermelon. I mean, decent ones, but this thing is huge. So we thought we'd just see how big it is. All right, Lane. Lane, how much did you weigh a while ago? You're putting this on YouTube? Yes, it's on YouTube. 163. Oh my goodness. 163 pounds. Holy cow. Can I get on it yet? Okay, go. Here I go. go. Oh, spread your feet out. Spread your feet. Spread your feet. It's about to break. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why is your leg shaking? I think you've got to spread your feet out more evenly. Okay. 234 pounds. Okay, so. 234. He's about to drop it. Easy. Easy setting it down. That's a 70 pound watermelon. Alright, we just got out of the pool. We thought we'd have some watermelon, but before we chop this monster up, we wanted to weigh it. 30, or 71 pounds. 71 pound watermelon. <laughs> that is for a teenage boy. Nah. Anyway, so the food, it's just, it's amazing. I started about two years ago. My goal was whatever I put up to put up enough for us for a year. And I've been pretty successful at that. My canning shelves stay pretty full. The freezers, um, and that's all of just vegetables. We also raise pretty much all our own meat. Uh, and then I milk cows as some of you have seen on some of our videos. So I provide all our dairy. Uh, you can see Ben's greenhouse here. That's a new thing that was from just this spring. So we're hoping that's gonna provide us a way to provide vegetables all winter. So we do not grow our own grains. That's one area where I still buy, I buy wheat seed and I grind it myself, but we don't grow it. So, but other than that, we're pretty much providing all our own food. Now I'm not gonna lie, the kids still like McDonald's, and we still let them have it sometimes. I know that's terrible, but I don't want to be, I don't want to be so strict on them that when they grow up, they just go nuts because they never got any of that stuff. So we try to keep a good balance. And if you don't ever eat out, that's awesome. That would, that would be my goal, but I can't just decide that for my whole family. I gotta get them on board, so. I would say, I'll we'll let you peek in the door of the greenhouse. Eggplants galore, which we've never been able to grow outside. Spinach climbing up to the ceiling. Peppers. We need to do a little bit of planting in there, but overall, the greenhouse is doing awesome. All right, so I've told you some good things. Now it's time to move on to the bad. So I had a harder time coming up with bad things, but I guess there are a few things you would consider bad about homesteading. Number one is probably, this is something we've kind of moved past, but at first it was seemed like a bad thing, being tied down. We were so tied to this homestead that it felt like we could never go anywhere, couldn't go on vacation. Um, sometimes it was hard to even go somewhere for the day, but the longer we've done this, we've made it work. We, like last week, we posted a video, we went to a conference with our church we got up some mornings at five o'clock and fed animals so that we could stay all day and not have to worry about doing it when we got home. So we figured out how to make it work. And to be honest, we started with pigs. And after the first few animals, you're tied down anyway. So it doesn't really matter how many more animals you add to us, it seems like, because we're already tied down. So if we have sheep and goats and dogs and cats and all that, it's not really adding that much more to our being tied at home, I guess you'd say. One way to get through this is to find someone trusted that that can feed your animals and take care of your farm. They don't necessarily have to come stay at your farm, but if you just trust them enough for them to come once a day and do your chores, that's a great resource. We have some close family that comes and does ours, and if you find someone close enough to you that you feel comfortable enough calling when you're on vacation just to check on things and um, 
maybe just asking them, hey, you didn't forget so-and-so, did you? Um, if it's someone you're not very comfortable with, that can be a little awkward, like, like you're checking up on them. But if it's someone you're comfortable with, they understand that this is your livelihood and this is, there's a lot at stake when you leave your animals in someone else's care. So being tied down is one thing I think some people would consider bad. Um, another thing is things that it's made me learn about myself such as when I was growing up, I grew up on a golf course. So I did not grow up farming. Now, my parents were hard workers. They grew up, you know, in the country on farms like most people did um, in the generation before us. And especially a couple generations ago, pretty much everyone grew food and lived on farms. If you wanted to eat very much, you grew some things. It wasn't a hobby, it was just what you did. So, my parents have always been hard workers, but that doesn't mean that it translated then that I was. My mom did most everything when I was growing up, and I didn't do a whole lot. Uh, my parents had me and my brother when they were a little bit older, and if anyone like treasured their kids, it was my mom and dad. They, they were the parents that were at every event we were in I never knew what it was like for my parents not to be at something so they just they just took care of us treasured us um, supported us in all the things we wanted to do I was actually on the golf team and my my golf team won the state championship when I was in high school I was actually a senior in high school so that's the things I did well that didn't necessarily translate to when I got married, being a hard worker. When our first year of marriage, I didn't really even know how to wash clothes. I sure didn't know how to cook. And just all those things. I would call myself pretty much I was lazy. Not because I just sat around and um, ate ice cream on the couch all day, but because I just didn't really know how to do a whole lot. and. Um, when we got married, my husband's grandpa had just passed away and he left his land and he had some cows and things to my husband, his brother, and their mom. So, and my husband's brother has been in the Navy until just recently, so they didn't live here. Um, they helped as much as they could, but they didn't live here. And my mother-in-law is, is single and she works. And so, Ben did a lot of like the hands-on, like bush hogging, taking care of the cows, things like that, it, which he wanted to, don't get me wrong, he loved it. But he was busy and I wasn't. So that left me a lot of time and I, I remember those days kind of getting a little down and depressed, like I just didn't have enough to do. Um, and then I had my kids and I felt like this is my calling in life is to be a mom. And I know pro most people probably feel that way, maybe not, I don't know, but I did. I thought this is what I was meant to do. And that gave me things to do when I had the kids. And so I started staying home with them. And then we started slowly after a few years getting this farm going and we've gotten busier and busier. And I've learned about myself that being lazy and not doing a whole lot that makes me down in the dumps. And I'm not, I don't have depression where like I'm on medication and all that. And I know that's a serious thing and some people have it really bad and I feel for them. Mine just seems like if I don't stay busy, I'll get like the blues, I guess you'd say. So, um, I've just learned about myself. I thrive on hard work and being busy. If I've gotten dirty and sweated and gotten a lot done that day, I feel so good at night. Like I feel so productive. That's just who I am and I've learned that about myself. So I say the bad is figuring out those parts of yourself that aren't pretty and confronting them and, and changing. So laziness was definitely one for me. Um, ben and I have both struggled. Another bad part of homesteading, I guess you'd say, but it's turned out for the good. We've struggled with how to work together sometimes. Um, we do pretty good if if how do i say it if i let him lead which he's a leader and i'm not really now when i'm home by myself and i need to figure out how to do something i just jump in there and do it back up a trailer um 
load cows, whatever. Sometimes he comes home and he's surprised what all we have gotten done by ourselves, but he's a natural leader. So if I let him have that role and I jump in and help him, it's when we both try to be the leader that sometimes it doesn't work. And that, I know you've seen this shirt that says, I'm sorry for what I said while we were working cows or whatever. We joke that we need something that say, I'm sorry for what I said while we were working cows, pigs, chickens, sheep whatever because sometimes when we get stressed is when we don't work well together so we had to confront that and just um figure out how to work around that but i feel like we've we've come a long way we we jump in there and we spend almost all our time together so we've just had to figure that out so i guess you can call those bad things but they've actually turned out to be good things is learning yourself and and another bad thing, I guess, about it is I've always cared what people thought of me, or at least I used to. And so, and when you jump into this lifestyle, not everyone really agrees with it, or they kind of just sometimes give you the vibe that they think you're weird. So maybe you've never experienced that, but I have. So. I've had to let go of some of that about trying to be like everybody else and caring what they think and things like that. Um, people that know me have probably noticed over the last couple years I don't wear makeup hardly ever anymore. That's just something Ben wanted me to do for a long time. He always said, I just, I can't tell when you're wearing it when you're not, so why do you mess with it? And so I just started here and there not wearing it and it felt so good. Like I don't have makeup melting off my face all, when, all summer. And because we're, we're outside all the time sweating. And so that's just one little thing that I've kind of embraced. Like, I guess trying to be who I am and not just what everyone else is and what I is expected. So that's kind of been a bad thing for me in a way is having to stop being a people pleaser because living this lifestyle and some people just don't get it. So anyway, that's some of the bad things, but like, as I'm talking this out to you guys, some of them turn out to be good things. So anyway, let's move on to the ugly. So you wanna be a farmer. Farming's fun. Farming's a blast. You get all kinds of cute little baby animals. All the... Uh, nice fresh meats if you uh, raise your animals to eat farming's just a blast it's not all cookies and cream though it's not all luxurious most farms have hard times uh, seems like ours has hit uh, a couple of different things at a time here this last week and uh, with a busy week that we've had with nationals and all that for the kids and their church competition uh, one of our milk cows Susan got down last Friday and we worked for hours and hours no actually yes yes it was last Friday we worked for hours and hours trying to get her up and Get her working, get her back in, back under her, get it working where she would uh, be walking again. Well, she got up one time. By the next morning, she was back down. We've got vet bills. We've got hours and hours of working with her, trying to get her up and get her, uh, get her back healthy. And to no avail, she has uh, not ever stood back up. Now, she's fought and fought and done done circles around well as you see behind me we think it's time to put her out of her misery and by far this is one of my least favorite things uh, I have to do it uh, I know it's part of farming and it's uh, it's the part that I'm sure nobody just likes to do uh, but to humanely uh, To have animals, sometimes you have to put them down humanely. 
and uh, rather than them suffer and suffer and suffer. We've given her a fighting chance. We've done all we know to do. Talked to the vet, worked with the vet, got the shots. Uh, we was gonna try to, we thought about shooting her in, uh, a week ago and processing her, turning, in, turning her into hamburger. But we thought we'd give her a fighting chance. We gave her the steroids. We gave her uh, inflammation shots or whatever. Several different things and nothing's working. We've calcium tubes, uh, and she's just, she's looking pitiful. So, it's kind of sad to see. We've had her a tarp out here over, over a pen for a week, watering her, feeding her. And, uh, it's nothing's working. So, Instead of uh, having her suffer anymore, we've decided it's uh, it's time to put her down. So, like I said, definitely one of my least favorite things to do, but being the man of the house, I feel like I have to. Like I said, I don't know anybody that gets an enjoyment out of that. But farm life ain't always easy. Making decisions like that's not always easy. I know there's probably gonna be comments come across that should have done other things. When you're farming, you gotta do what you know is best and I hate seeing an animal suffer. I don't know where to go from there. So as you can see, here's what's left of the shelter. There's no tarp on it anymore. The water's been put back up, the water barrels. And come to find out, we're pretty sure we've narrowed down what happened. Um, she had a calf like six weeks ago and she seemed fine she got a little mastitis we got that taken care of which is not uncommon when a milk cow has a huge bag like that so we got that taken care of she was doing great and she just went down well come to find out we talked to um, a neighbor and he said well I really wonder if she didn't shed all her afterbirth he said but you would have definitely smelled something um, not long after she calved. She should have shed it within like a day or two. Well, guess what? I did smell something. But after a day or so, it was gone. So, now, I've learned something. I won't ever do that again. If I And Ben, actually, I had him smell it too. But... He's, he was raised working in a dairy. That's where, when he was like 13, he got a job at a dairy. So he knows a lot about dairy cows, a lot about dairying, but he'd just never been closely involved on that particular problem, I guess. Um, we didn't know what we were smelling for, to be honest. So, and then after a, just a day or so, that smell was gone. The next time she came in the barn, she was fine and she acted fine. Well, what had happened is if they don't shed all their afterbirth, um, their uterus will close up around it after a few days and then it's too late. An infection sets in but it's closed up you're not going to smell anything at that point and that infection is going to spread through our whole body. So the shots we were given for the pinched nerve weren't doing any good because she had a raging infection. So those are just little nuggets that we tuck away for the future so that hopefully that will never happen again. But to be honest that doesn't make this instance feel any better. Because knowing that Susan slowly suffered and died for weeks and I could have done something to ease her pain or to save her, that feels pretty ugly to me. So, um, I don't, that's just the ugly side of it. Animals die. Um, and that comes back to another thing about learning about yourself. And 
I have learned over time, and I should have known this time, but God has given us instincts and intuition, and I knew something smelled funny, and I should have investigated further. I shouldn't have been too busy or too preoccupied and said, eh, it's okay now. No, there was a reason, and I should have investigated. And that's like another time, another ugly side of homesteading. Last spring, we had a really wet spring, and someone farms part of our land back here behind our house. I'm going to show it to you. We have, we have several hundred acres that a local feed mill farms back here. Well, there was a spot in the back, way back that way, that they weren't going to be able to get to. And the grass was tall. It was beautiful grass. And we cut hay for our cows. And they cut hay to um, chop silage and make feed and stuff. Well, they said, we're not going to be able to get to it, but it's fertilized. It's really good. Just go ahead. Y'all cut it if you want to, if you can get it dried out. Well, we jumped on the chance. We went back there and we cut it. Well, the ground underneath it was wet. And Ben said, I just don't feel comfortable bailing this. It's too wet. Well, it was Memorial Day weekend and we really needed to get it bailed if we were gonna because then Ben was gonna have to go back to work. Well, I, my personality is I'm a let's jump in and get it done. And Ben is a let's go slow and do it right. Well, even though the ground underneath it was wet, I talked him into let's just go ahead and rake it up in the wind rows and then it'll finish drying so he let me talk him into it and it was against his better judgment we raked it up but it was still really damp well we went ahead and bailed it and he said i if you know about bailing hay if you bail wet hay it can catch on fire well it didn't catch on fire it sat there a few days and didn't catch on fire again remember this was my idea not his and I basically talked him into doing this just to get it done. Well, we brought it home. Never did catch on fire, but what happened is it molded inside. And then in the middle of the winter, I bought a new milk cow. I actually bought two of them. Put some of that hay out. One of them ate it and laid out here and died. Didn't ever know what happened. We were, we were like, I have no idea. She was gonna have, fixing to have a calf. We were like, maybe it was the calf. We didn't know. Few months went by and we bought another couple milk cows and we put out another bell of that hay and one laid out here and bloated and me and a neighbor an old dairy farmer neighbor had to come out here and actually it's kind of gruesome we had to stick a knife down in her left side and let some of that air out because she was bloated she was at the point of death it's literally a miracle that that cow lived but she did live and it was our son lane who said you know y'all put that same hay out twice when that one died and now this one's bloated and it dawned on us that hay we bailed wet molded and so again it was it was pretty much our fault for losing a cow so i've had to on the ugly side of homesteading i've had to learn some things about myself like my way is not always best if you're not doing something right just jumping in there and saying you got it done so you can check it off your list your animal's lives could be at stake. So that's another thing I've had to um, learn through homesteading is patience. Because I'm a list checker. I have lists every day. And I like to get things done. And I don't like to wait. So I would say that is the ugly side of homesteading for me. Is realizing that me pushing my way and my will when it's not the right thing to do. That could cost you and your animals financially, emotionally. I mean, it upset all of us to lose this milk cow, Susan. So that's another ugly side of homesteading that I've really had to confront. So I hope you've learned something from this video. Um, there's a lot of good with homesteading, but it is not all roses. It's financially draining, physically, emotionally, um, but I wouldn't do it any other way. Even with all the things that have happened, I wouldn't change a thing. So the thing I would change, I guess, is the mistakes I've made that cost some of our animals their lives. But what I try to do is learn from it, learn about myself why those things happened, and use those in the future to not let it happen again. And I have actually, I feel like I've grown from those experiences because there's times since then that I've thought, I want to get this done today. And then I've stopped myself and think, it doesn't have to be done today. 
it'll be okay it'll still be there tomorrow now there always is those things that they have to be done but usually things can wait especially if it means the choice between just getting it done and doing it right so anyway i hope this has helped you in some way thanks for following us and if you haven't yet hit the subscribe button and leave us a comment thanks and god bless